Dynatrace is expanding its Davis AI engine to create the industry's first hypermodel AI, converging fact-based casual AI and predictive AI insights with new generative AI capabilities. And to deep dive into this announcement, today we have with us Alois Reitbar, Chief Technology Strategist at Dynatrace. Alois, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me. what you folks are announcing today. So what we're announcing is uh, extending our DVZI, which has been around for a very long time, uh, with a new component, which is called Davis Copilot, a generative uh, AI component. But the real announcement is not that we just generate, uh, adding um, an LLM to it. It's, it's really that entire platform that our customers have available, which we refer to as hypermodal AI. So, you might wonder what, what, what is actually hypermodal uh, AI. And I think we can describe it maybe in two, maybe four sentences here. So first of all, hypermodal AI is a combination of different types of AI. So we talk, as you mentioned, about predictive AI, which does forecasting, anomaly detection, has some basic understanding of uh, what metrics means, and causal AI, which can do cause and effect analysis. We do it a lot for problem analysis. So what's the impact? what's the root cause. So instead of like having raw alerts, you combine those and it uses a multitude of um, mechanisms uh, to do this behind the scenes using like the understanding environment with what we call smartscape analysis, uh, understanding the topology and uh, of the environment and so forth. And then there is obviously the uh, LLM component, uh, which is Davis uh, uh, Copilot. So that, that's one way. We're combining multiple ways of AI together and make them interact with each other. The other way, what we're doing with the data is we take that raw input data, which is traces, metrics, logs, user sessions, metadata, events, and so forth, and are semantically enriching them. So what does this mean? We take like these modalities of data and kind of like convert them into what I would call like a hypermodality. Like you have a time series stream of data and we say, wait, this time series stream has actually response time. It belongs to a certain service. It is linked to a certain service level objective. Based on this service level objective, it's behaving like this. This is its error budget. We also predict this metric to behave like this going forward based on past data on the predictive side. And we also know about this metric um, that uh, it was involved in a couple of problems in the past once it behaves in a certain way. For another one, though, our analysis might look entirely different. This is a conversion rate. Again, it has goals. This is how it behaved. This is the um, user sessions, user interactions. It uh, actually depends on and so forth. And again, or even linking that metric then maybe to a response time metric that we had before. So we're really changing that or augmenting the meaning. And then like taking the input from the predictive, feeding it into the causal AI when we do the root cause uh, analysis by detecting anomalies, see how things fit together, do the cause and effect analysis, not only telling you that 15 things in the systems are wrong, but telling you this is the actual reason it's related to a deployment, this changed in this deployment, and these are like the impacted users and so forth. Then we can take all of this information, for example, to create a remediation proposal or uh, to do like other types of automation based on it into an LLM. So obviously prompt engineering is this critical piece you do with LLMs that you have to tell it what you actually want it to do. We can create like this very specific, very context intense prompts to make it either generate something automatically like the remediation examples or we could go the other way around where the user asks something and we augment that query by the user um, so that we can automatically build notebooks, dashboards, workflows, or even answer questions what they should be doing in their environment. Think of a very simple question. You're asking the system, okay, show me all services that will be relevant on Black Friday. If you would ask an LLM out of the box, the answer would be Black Friday is usually a day of very high intense load. All of your services that are subject to have erroneous or failure mode behavior under high load are the ones that you should be monitoring. Yeah, thanks, but kind of like, thanks for nothing. I, I knew this up front. What we would do, we take that input, and that, that's where you see the different modalities playing together, uh, take that initial input uh, of the LLM, understand what it actually means, and we go back to 
Causally, I like show me all user interactions that have conversion rates. For all of those user transactions, show me all the systems um, or the services in the system that are related to those. Then we go to predictive AI. Tell me which, what's the SLO and the target goals uh, for these specific services, response time, failure rates, and so forth. Then we again ask for the predictive AI. For those services, how would they most likely behave under a significantly higher load? And once we have collected all of this information, we put it back into a very large prompt to tell the LLM to build the dashboard that we initially wanted for us. And that's a very different output than just telling me that I should take care of the services that might have problems under load. So I think these are two good examples of one, what it does like on the analytics side and how it feels for a user to act with a hypermodal AI. One question that I want to ask before we go deeper into especially what you folks are doing is that uh, we always hear uh, buzzwords that a few years ago, a few months ago, NFT was a big thing. And, you know, now we are talking about generative AI. Uh, of course, you know, we have to dip our toes in all these technologies to see how. But do you feel that generative AI is the next Docker containers, you know, because that technology when, and they change the world, you know, then Kubernetes change the world. Or you think that, hey, this is uh, blip. I mean, it's hard to predict, but since we are talking about predictive AI, so let's hear what you think uh, is the reality there. Uh, I think it's going to do two things. It's going to make us rethink of uh, how we interact with systems and how good we want systems to be. And like also as our main goal is like really increasing productivity by what LMs can do. And to be fair, they can do certain very impressive things. Um, this is also where we believe, like why should anybody still build a dashboard, write a query? and do those kind of things when you have capabilities that can do it. But at the same time, and that's also why we combine it with other types of AI technologies, we should be aware of that these systems are only as good as their input. The question shouldn't be like, is LLM the technology that's going to change anything? Which other technology does it need to be combined with? And we believe other forms of AI have to play together. And even if you see it, other tools that, that are emerging and tool chains like Lung chain and others where these EI agents are now starting to emerge. It's not LLMs only. They play a crucial role, but they not, do not make like a full AI platform. And I, will, I think we will see that some, uh, some disappointment of people like solely relying on LLMs. And like one of the, the favorite example we use over here is ask an LLM to tell you how much is 5,000 times 3,000. That's a very simple calculation, but that's not what an uh, LLM was built for. What it could do is it could figure out that you wanted to do a calculation, use a third party plugin to actually perform this, actually outsource it to another model, to another service. And I think that's where we will see a lot of development. I think it will really depend on what the, those architectures looks like. It's not just, okay, I have an LLM here. I'll ask it something, I'll get an answer. I might ask it a bit more clever things on the prompt. So we will see both. We will see certain systems getting more and uh, more and more powerful over time. And others will kind of like stay uh, where they have been for a very long time. Uh, think of like Amazon Alexa. In the beginning, this was like amazing technology. Wow, Alexa. And what are people using it today for? Playing some music and using it as a timer when you cook eggs or put something into the oven. Because the technology and the backend services and the other capabilities that were actually needed did not involve us quickly. There were like no real proactive components in there. So. It's actually a base technology and ChatGPT for sure has exposed it to a large, well, to almost everybody in the world who has a computer right now, maybe. But it's not the built-in product. It's a demo application. I think people have to come over this like technology enthusiasm and learning how to build real systems on top of it. Very good point. And that's for, well, my next question is that uh, it, it, we are still in a very early phase where we are seeing a lot of excitement, but you folks are moving with a product which actually going to help businesses in uh, real production. Um, can you talk a bit about, once again, going back to, as you're giving the example of Alexa, uh, how much work teams, organizations need to do themselves to, once again, take leverage of some of these new generative AI technologies, because that sometimes becomes a kind of hurdle, roadblock, because things are already complicated, economy is crazy. Where you folks come in uh, with these technologies, lower the barrier of entry, so they start taking advantage of these versus, you know, investing too many resources. Does that question make sense? 
I think if you got it right, like how can people like leverage the technology without having to invest and learn a lot? Uh, and I think that's key. Uh, like for us, we also don't want people to become experts in prompt engineering for um, Davis Copilot. That's not our goal. Most of the AI on the causal and predictive side has been around for a very long time, almost a decade. It has been used for that long. So this is like ready-made customers are using it today. Uh, we believe a lot of the AI analytics is going to happen ubiquitously in the background. We don't expect the user to be very knowledgeable to put in information, understand how to use those systems. Our goal is really to make it as natural as the example that I shared before. Show me all my Black Friday relevant services. Most likely this output in a pure LLM only scenario won't produce a good output. So we do all the heavy lifting and all the platform work in the back. And I think that's, that's really the key here, uh, where we invest our time. is like really building this hypermodal approach where we decided to not just, uh, bless you, not just go for an LLM, but build an entire platform that can be used in a way that's as, that sometimes I think just automatically for you, like proposing, hey, it seems like you're trying to build this. Maybe you want this and this component as well. All the way that you can ask um, questions like right straight away and for us, this was also a key driver. Like we have all these capabilities uh, in the Dynatrace platform, uh, but or luckily we added, uh, or we're glad that we added a capability to also cater more to business audiences with business events. But do we expect the business user <clears throat> to really understand how to write a DQL? That's the Dynatrace query language query. Do we want to teach them? No. That's where natural language input comes in. I think it's really for those AI systems that have to take the burden away to interact with them and provide value without people yet having to learn another technology. I think this will drive um, adoption going forward. How good do they get at understanding what we want uh, and how we do it? And how, how big is the margin of error in prompts that we can put in there? And even if you look at what OpenAI states on their website, they say the quality of your prompt will impact the output. It will impact how much it should hallucinate. That's why I'm not just going for like one model, one technology, but you're going for an integrated system platform type of approach that takes this burden away from you. I think those systems will eventually be the ones that will be um, competitively and will stay. I will not ask you to give any names or something like that, but I do want to understand if you can share either some of the use cases or industries where you do think that, uh, you know, the David, you know, uh, AI or Copilot is going to help all these other industries which are like very, very quick to embrace and all, all these industries, they should because that's going to help them a lot. We have a very wide customer base and actually everybody who's using Dynatrace is using a Davis AI today. So the predictive and the causal parts are used today. And how does it help them? One use case is very clearly a uh, problem analysis, like root cause analysis and driving automation there. So we know our systems are getting bigger. They're getting more complex. We run in multiple cloud infrastructures um, because we use different services from different clouds or ended up there for other reasons. Um, teams are getting uh, bigger, have to take on more responsibilities. Applications themselves get more complicated. And how we help them is like really manage these systems from an observability and security point of view and being able to faster assess problems. And by automating this analysis of problems and how they work and then triggering automations based of, uh, out of this to not just get pure alerts, but saying, okay, this is the root cause. This is the impact acting on the root cause, remediating also the impact is where we can help. And by putting this, into Davis AI and doing it fully automatically, we can bring down the meantime to repair massively. And that's just not a bold claim, but it, 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 it makes very much sense if you link, look at it about it, how we would have to do manually. You would have to look at a dashboard or multiple. You would have to make sense out of it. You would have to run a couple of queries. Then you have to think about like how all this data fits together. This will take you minutes or hours, or in some cases, even days, if you don't know where to look. For an automated AI system, this can be done in milliseconds. So MTTR is massive there. So when, the, when you look at the benefits for customers, it's really twofold. They can really, with a very small dedicated team, manage very large infrastructures. And again, this is not about like that any jobs will go away. All of our customers are in the opposite situations. They have more work or more 
tasks and projects that people should be working on that they have people and they can't hire them for different reasons. And obviously the other reason is when we talk about MTTR, uh, especially our customers in the travel and e-commerce industries, but also the financial industries now more and more as well, uh, downtime or problems with the applications can be related directly to revenue loss. If I talk to an e-commerce customer and ask them, how much is like, does one minute downtime mean for you? They can give me a dollar value and that dollar value is six, seven or eight figures depending on the size of the business. And as we're mostly working with the Fortune 15,000, expect a lot of them to be eight figures. Obviously for e-commerce, it's obvious, okay, people cannot um, buy on your shops, you're using money. But think of the travel industry. You cannot board your airplane. What do you think is it going to cost if your airplane has to leave like one hour later from an airport just because you couldn't find people's luggage or you couldn't board that plane? We just recently had a, a case study with um, uh, an airport on this topic uh, as well. Or banking. If you have to do some critical transaction and they will, <clears throat> and the bank will tell you, well, our banking systems are in maintenance. They might or might not be up tomorrow. So that's where we can already help them today. And that's where we're adding massive value. Now we're just taking this to the next level. One of these use cases is what we call predictive operations. There are a lot of operations tasks that you, that you exactly know when you have to do them. Simple things like disk resizing, automatically scaling infrastructure. But how do you know when you have to do it? This is again where you rely on the, uh, the predictive and causal capabilities of Davis AI. Like tell me what my response times or my lowest most likely going to look like in half an hour from, from now. Tell me which other services will be affected by certain behavior. And then driving auto scaling in your environment or like tell me what uh, my disk consumption will be, which takes actually some time to resize this. These are simple tasks that we are automating, but I think even there we have reached the next level. It's like they're not the simple, simple tasks. These are, well, for humans, simple tasks, but these are tasks that require some cognitive analytics capabilities to properly drive them. They might even require a couple of like steps of cognitive analysis until you re uh, really arrive at the actual goal of what you want to do. That's also why we opened up Davis AI right now so that you can more or less build your own analysis chains based on you, what you want to do. And again, to your earlier question, does it make it harder for people? And we deliberately built it that way that you don't have to be a, a data scientist or machine learning expert. You just tell what you want to do. I want to know what this metric will look like in half an hour from now. I want to understand which other services this, this service is interacting with. So like very easy to understand, easy to comprehend analysis steps that you can build and chain together. And then based on top of it, there's lots of other productivity enhancements like automatically creating dashboards, uh, AI powered notebooks, like an analysis notebooks where you only need to specify what you want to get at from uh, at the result and then queries, charts and so forth are built automatically for you, automatically proposing remediation hints based on the root cause analysis that Davis AI has done. Like you need to increase your memory settings here. You need to tweak your Kubernetes configuration um, over there. Obviously the same for creating workflows. Uh, whenever a problem occurs, route it to the responsible person, which means you have to extract ownership information, set up Chiro ticketing and ticketing and align stuff, but in a massive productivity scale. So I think as we have seeing more and more platform teams today, where we have decentralized uh, observability and security uh, offerings, at the same time, people want to customize it to their use case. And what this will also allow to do is mass customization so that everybody in the enterprise gets exactly the view they want without having to learn another tool. How do you see that uh, generative AI and these kind of, you know, uh, technology solutions that Dynatrace is coming, how this is going to further, you know, evolve observability? How you see the evolution of uh, observability through these technologies? Yeah, I think if you look at observability, and I've been in this field for quite some time, it really moved from like this almost niche for like very large enterprises, highly specialized expert technology 
uh, which is also where we started. Like it has to be like an observability back then. We called them APM tools. Uh, it was like this expert tools. What we saw, the more accessible we made the platform with Dynatrace, either by the way we structured the product, the way we explained things, the more we saw people using it, like a wider adoption in the enterprise. Not just the expert teams, but the individual teams. Um, as like a general pattern we saw, like but the more easier accessible you make uh, the platform, the more people are going to use it. The more people have access to the data, they can work with it and they're going to use it. Today, observability is, uh, I think, widely accepted, way more than it was at the very beginning when Dynatory started to, to enter that field. Like it's something that everybody needs to do. So we need to make it more accessible to even more people. And I think that's where, especially on the productivity side, the getting started side, uh, generative AI can help a lot. Because you don't have to be that expert. You have, a, again, a lower entry barrier. And you can still go into the full uh, power of all those tools that they actually provide with all of their capabilities. Because people might feel overwhelmed. Yeah, now I have all this data. What, what, what should I do with it? And the, the, the actual question that you would want to end, ask the system is like, what, what should I look at now? Uh, tell me what's like, what's like important. And again, this is a good example of where the LLM itself wouldn't be able to provide a good answer. And that's why we believe in hypermodal AI, because if you would just ask it, what should I look at it? Yeah, response times are important. Error rates are important. Um, resource consumption is important. So you should look at all of those. Well, versus, versus combining it with causal and predictive, while well, these services used to cause some problems in the past, these are your most critical ones, which again might be, for example, close to running out of an error budget on your SLOs, or these are other connected services that should be relevant. These recently changed. So the answer quality will be much better. I think the, this, this entry barrier and even like helping people to use tools properly and uh, in observability we often talk about the unknowns unknown and the unknown unknowns like where well, we can't explicitly ask for what we want uh because we don't know yet i think especially there it can help like tell me what's important tell me what's going on in the system which is nothing you can immediately write into a query where the system wouldn't have an answer unless we have like this whole uh combination which we refer to as hypermodal ai um, to provide you these answers. So I think we will see a commoditization of the usage of observability tools even more as we move in that direction. But I think it's commoditization in a good way. It's not that the tools lose value and the people don't see the value, but they become way easier to use, way easier to adopt. It requires less expert knowledge. The tools will explain even more what they're showing, why they are showing it. I also want to ask, as you earlier said, you know, we have been leveraging AI for a very long time. Talk a bit about how this approach is a bit different from, if you use the term, traditional or legacy approach of leveraging AI. Our approach always was to use the best technology for the best job. So we always said like machine learning for a lot of areas we work in doesn't really work. Like for the cause effect analysis, it's not the ideal choice. For the predictive, it was not the ideal choice. There you want to have obviously different algorithms that you're using. And again, today we see some people experimenting using LLMs for cause and effect analysis, which to be fair, for very simple use cases work. But as you understand how LLMs actually work internally and how they were trained, it actually doesn't work that way. So I think our approach is different that we always agree that we need to combine different types of AI together. And also that we need to augment the data. We need to have interconnected data. What like the second dimension of the hypermodal approach to do more qualitative reasoning over the data. That is not just a metric. No, it's a response time. It belongs to a service that's related to a login where currently users are having problem. So our approach was really building like this powerful integrated architecture on how to work with AI, like rather looking at the individual pieces and just applying them on some data, which like where the very first type of AI ops, uh, was as well. Like, just use some machine learning in a response time. And even having the user decide, like we also take this out of the user's uh, responsibility. Like we take, make these choices for them and ensure that they get the right data without even having them to become an uh, expert in, in the analysis. And also, yes, you don't have to open up the hood to understand how the motor's working. You just can get in and drive. That's, that's our approach and how we, 
how we work with these technologies. Lois, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, your announcement and also going deeper into whole generative AI approach, how it will also kind of transform uh, observability. Thanks for those insights. And I would love to chat with you folks again. Thank you. Thank you.